Good morning everyone. If I could ask everyone to please take their seats. <clears throat> Good morning everyone. I'm Catherine Anderson. I'm the Deputy Director at uh, the New Venture Institute at Flinders and I'd like to welcome you here to Flinders University at Tonsley. I'd also like to acknowledge that we meet this morning on the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respects to their elders past and present. It's a delight uh, for me to introduce to you today, uh, or, or to host today, Michelle Bowen. Uh, I'm not going to tell you much about, uh, about Michelle, I'm going to leave that to, to Vaughan who will, will fill you in a little bit more. My task is simply to welcome you here to Tonsley today. Uh, a new building, we've been in here just under a year, so uh, we moved in here in January. Uh, the site's been open a little bit longer. And one of the things I'm really excited about for this morning's presentation is the fact that the idea behind this site is that this is a cooperative, interoperative site uh, where we all, the, the, the sum of the parts is, no, the sum of the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So that's going to be wonderful to listen to Michelle today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping uh, items. If you are needing the restrooms, you need to go outside the building again, turn to your right, go through the other double doors and the toilets are behind the, the lift there. In case of emergency, we'll hear the usual whoop whoops and the beep beeps and we'll all head out the doors this way and we'll turn to the left and congregate on the, the, the open space out in front. That's enough from me. I'm excited for you all to be here uh, and I'd like to uh, inv invite Vaughan to the stage. Water? Uh, yes, you can. Now I'm just trying to think where there might be public, uh, public water fountains. There are on the ground floor, near the toilets. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I'll just adjust this for me. Um, and welcome to our seminar today. Um, and thank you for your time. I know everyone's really busy at this time of year. Um, my name is Vaughan Levitsky. I'm chief executive of what used to be called Zero Waste SA. Now it's transitioning into a new organisation called Office of Green Industries SA. Um, I too would like to acknowledge we meet on the lands of the Ghana people 
and we respect their relationship with country. Um, I'd also like to thank the Department of State Development um, for working with us to organise the event today and the New Ventures Institute here at Flinders University um, for being a, a strong partner and supporting this event as well uh, and making the venue available. And it's, a, it's a great venue, actually. I've not seen such technology for quite a while, so it's, it's, it's quite impressive. Um, we also welcome the General Manager of the Business Council of Cooperatives and Mutuals, uh, Alexandra Horden, who is here from Sydney for this session. Um, and I'd also like to just quickly thank Sharon Eid and Matt Scales from my organisation for helping to bring this event together uh, and a series of events actually over the last few days. We live in changing times and along with the climate so are our economic imperatives and as South Australia looks to meet the challenges of a changing economic base with the rise of new businesses, the decline of traditional industries and shifting employment patterns, we need new thinking to navigate our way forward and to work out how we can build on the prosperity in our state. We are not the first to encounter these issues and we certainly won't be the last. As part of the government's approach to addressing these challenges, uh, the Office of Green Industries has been charged with the task of fostering green industries and growing green jobs including what role businesses, business models could play. The Department of State Development Employment Director has been doing some great work in exploring finance options and business models, convening a session in October attended by over 100 people. One of the possibilities that sparked a lot of interest and discussion was that of cooperatives and the benefits of such models. The cooperative isn't a new concept and there are already many successful co-ops in Australia and in, and in South Australia. The Barossa co-op is just one example. Now new types of cooperatives are offering exciting, innovative possibilities for how we work and generate our livelihoods and how we can create prosperity. So we're pleased to have arranged the visit to Adelaide by internationally renowned collaborative economy expert, Mr Michelle Bowens, who is on his last day of a three-week speaking and workshop tour through New Zealand and Australia. And I believe he's also been on the road for seven months, so this is a long time away from home. Michelle is the founder of the, uh, founder of the Foundation for Peer-to-Peer -peer Alternatives and Head of Research for Commons Transition. He's a theorist, academic writer, researcher and conference speaker on new technology, digital media, cultural politics, governance and social and economic innovation. He works in collaboration with a global group of researchers and travels extensively giving master classes and public lectures on the open, free, participatory, sharing and commons oriented modes of human cooperation and the opportunities they present. Michelle is a founding member of the Commons Strategies Group which organises major global conferences on the commons and economics. He holds advisory positions, fellowships and associations with a variety of organisations from Beijing to Amsterdam to San Francisco and has taught in universities from Bangkok to Rio. No wonder he's on the road so much. Michelle's work includes a focus on cooperatives and so we've invited him here, him here to talk to us about how our cooperatives, business models, could help address some of our challenges. Michelle will share with us case studies where emerging forms of cooperatives are, developing, are delivering real world benefits through meaningful employment that contributes to economic and social vitality while also seeking to address the many environmental challenges we're facing. This is also being recorded and um, the, the uh, recording of this session will be available on the Flinders University uh, website and also the Zero Waste SA website. So without any further talk from me, I'd like to introduce Michelle Bowens. So please welcome Michelle. Um, I think that's a good height for me too. Um, well, thank you so much for inviting me and especially Sharon and Matt, uh, you know, for doing all the details of getting me here. Um, my talk will be especially directed to people from the cooperative world 
and a bit from people uh, from the government. Um, and it's going to be like three moments. The first moment you will you may like, going to say good things about co-ops. The second part will be a warning. If you're not adapt to something that's coming, you may not be there. Uh, and the third part will be, you know, what what can we do to actually use co-ops in this emerging new world? So first, maybe the good things. Um, I like this quote. This is a study of French tech startups uh, comparing the startup models to the co-op models. I think it speaks for itself. Just read it for you. So co-op businesses have lower failure rates than traditional corporations and small businesses after the first year and after five years of business. So um, in the first year, for 60 to 80 percent of startups that fail, only 10 percent of co-ops fail. And after five years, 90 percent of co-ops are still in business, but only three to five percent of startups are still in business. I think this is very important because, you know, I get this all the time. People who come from business schools, they say co-ops don't work. Um, and, you know, they, they don't talk about co-ops in MBAs. They, it's totally ignored. They may have two paragraphs in their three or four years of study, which I hope you are working on this because it's really important that, you know, this, this gets uh, into the, the curricula. Um, and they don't know that uh, co-ops have 20% more employment than all the multinational companies combined. Uh, so this is the good news, I think. Um, so um, this is something that you probably know as a co-op member. Um, one of the richest regions in the world is Emilia-Romagna, the province around Bologna. Uh, one of the highest living standards in Europe and one of the lowest unemployment rates. And it has the strongest co-op economy in Europe. It's, I think it's about 30% of GDP and 50% of the population is working uh, or involved closely with, with the cooperative economy. Um, but I have to tell you, even there, um, they are being challenged. And they're being challenged by the um, emergence of uh, clandestine uh, Chinese uh, workshops that operate right in the heart of Italy with near slave labor and are undermining the traditional crafts economy that was the hallmark, hallmark of this Italian model. Um, so I think Emilia Romagna is actually still doing quite better than the other region in the north of Italy, but I was in Mantova, uh, which is in, in Lombardy the Milan region, and in the heartland of the city, one business was closing every day, every day of the year. So 365 closures uh, in a year. Uh, and this is happening uh, in other regions as well. Um, maybe anticipating what I'll talk about in terms of good examples, let me just show you one that I like quite a bit. And this is, I'll tell you more afterwards, uh, but one model that I talk about a lot is Enspiral in, um, yeah, you can't really see it, but anyway, I'll, I'll talk about it. So in New Zealand, you'll find a co-op called Enspiral, and I will tell you why I think this is a, a, a really important model uh, for the future of co-ops. Because, okay, so what what is the problem that I'm talking about? What is... Um, what is happening? Um, if you look at the role of information technology, I think we can usefully distinguish two periods. And the first period starts with the invention of the microchip in 1973 and ends, ends in 93 with the invention of the browser, uh, Mosaic as it was called. And this, I think, is one October 93. The first period we had networks, but the networks were almost exclusively used by huge multinational companies and eventually governments. And this is what gave us neoliberal globalization, right? The ability to reorganize supply chains on a global basis, m move manufacturing to the global south, and still maintain control uh, by Western multinationals 
uh, is very much a result of the capacity of this first wave of IT. Um, the second wave, which starts when networks become civic, when because of the browser, uh, everyone can start using the networks, uh, has created something new. Just to give you an example, there is a report called the Fair Use Economy Report, uh, 2011, so not too new. Uh, they've done, they did two of them, one in 2009. The economy of shared resources, the fair use economy, so knowledge that is not privatized, is one-sixth of GDP and employs 17 million workers just in the United States. So what is happening today is that we have Think about it. Why, why does IBM join Linux? Right? Why would IBM, a, pri a huge private multinational, join the open source uh, economy of shared code, which is Linux, an alternative operating system to, to the, for the computer? Uh, why would E.ON, which is the second largest uh, en energy company uh, in Germany, split in two? and organize one of the two companies exclusively as a service company for distributed renewable energy, which is produced by two million energy producers, the consumer co-ops in Germany. Why, why is Elon Musk opening up its battery knowledge to the whole world, right? So what's happening here is that even from the point of view of <clears throat> you know, pure capitalist logic, like how can I maximize my profit? So here's, here's the, 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 the underlying reason. You have one company with 50 researchers. It's privatizing its knowledge. It's competing against everybody else. Or you have a company like IBM which says, okay, I'm going to save 90% of my infrastructural costs by joining a, common, a, code of, uh, a commons of code along with many other companies. I'm going to pay 2,000 people, but for that investment of 2,000 people, I'm going to have access to 25,000 people, all the people paid by my competitors, and 25% of the people who are not paid to do Linux, but are doing it for their own reasons, right? Because once you have an open code, open design, open knowledge, then you don't necessarily have to get paid to improve that code base, right? Because if you're a developer or a user of technology and you have a problem, you can solve it, which is something you cannot do if you use private knowledge. If you use Microsoft and you have a problem, you have to call up somebody or you have to pay somebody internally full time, right? Think about the farmers today when they buy a John Deere tractor. They're not buying a tractor. They're leasing software, which they are forbidden to tamper with and they, they are not allowed to repair their own machines. So this is happening on a massive scale. Uh, and this is already, I'm moving here to the problem. So we have the emergence of global open design communities, right? We have open knowledge, Wikipedia. We have open code, like Linux. And we have open design for manufacturing. I don't know if you're familiar with Wikispeed, the open source car which is five times as fuel efficient as any commercial car on the market. I don't know if you're familiar with WikiHouse, which is a net, an open platform for sustainable living and housing that is a capable, a capable of making carbon positive housing, not just carbon neutral, but carbon positive housing. So this is from New Zealand. I was there uh, before coming here. 70% um, of the housing stock in New Zealand is toxic, uh, mold. Uh, in the house. Now what you do in a traditional industry is you isolate your house, but then what you have is that all the toxic material they're using in the construction st is trapped in your house. So you have a choice between getting sick from the mold or getting sick from, uh, from the toxic fumes from your own house. There is no way out within the industry at present. But WikiHouse is an open platform, an open design community, which, which uh, unites architects and urbanists throughout the world that are putting all the shared knowledge about creating housing that is non-toxic in an open platform. 
So if you're an entrepreneur, you could say, I'm going to make sustainable housing, and all that knowledge is available for all the entrepreneurs that are doing uh, this, this uh, housing. Um, so what's happening is that in, in many, many, and more and more industrial sectors, what you see is that once you have this open design emergence, you will see that the companies who, who join these new ecosystems replace the old players. Um, this is less so in legacy industries, but look at new look at new industries. Look at 3D printing. Look at the Arduino, uh, which is uh, open design motherboards. If you're young and, and entrepreneurial today, if you want to do synthetic biology, you know the choice is very easy. You can spend a lot of money on patents and probably be bankrupt in five years, or you can join an open design community, and all the money that you spend on patents, you'll have spent it on your own business development. And you'll be part of an entrepreneurial commons of many entrepreneurs that are co-developing you know, something they have in common, right? Um, now, where's the problem? The problem is that this kind of model is emergent, um, but actually, the, the dominant model today around these commons is an extractive model, right? And that co-ops are not sufficiently aware that they, that they can join this. So why is this a problem? Well, the most extreme example would be Facebook. I use Facebook, and all my smart friends hate Facebook, but I like Facebook. It's easy to use. And I build my audience largely through Twitter and Facebook. Um, but what is the problem with Facebook? So if you look at the use value equation, um, I'm using it, think about this, the, the migrants from Syria, right? Millions of people using secret Facebook groups to know where they have to go, what borders are open and closed, what buses they have to take, what trains they have to take. So they're using the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of Facebook, the ability to connect with 1.5 billion people without asking permission to anyone. They're using the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of Facebook to massively self-organize. And this is good. On the other hand, if you look at the exchange value, the business side of Facebook, I think you will agree with me that an empty platform has no value, right? So clearly, it's our activity, our interaction, our communication that feeds the value the commercial value of Facebook. But Facebook does not reinvest anything in this user community and its productive capacity. So this is the key problem. It's a bit extreme with Facebook, but think about Uber and Airbnb. So you have two kinds of the commons economy. You have an economy that actually creates a commons. So o open knowledge, open code, and open design. <coughs> You also have another economy, which is the, what, what, they, what we call the sharing economy, and it's actually not a sharing economy because people are renting and selling. But what they are doing is, is a bit similar, is they're allowing people to exchange with each other, right? And the effect of Uber and Airbnb on a local market is pretty much the same as a big uh, grocer, right? Uh, if you put a grocer in a local economy, 30% of the local flow goes, goes away, right? It, it takes the, the value that's being created and it, it goes to the owners that are remote. It doesn't reinvest in the local economy. And so here we have something that is emerging, which I think is very problematic. It's a new form of capitalism. I call it netarchy cap capitalism. Let me see if I have it here. No. Okay, sorry. It has disappeared. All right. Um, so we have a new form of capitalism. Think about this. Uber does not invest in cars. It does not make cars. It enables us to do ride hailing. Airbnb does not invest in apartment building or hotel building, in hospitality. They allow us to share and rent our apartments. Google does not produce documents. It allows us to find each other's documents. 
right? Facebook does not produce communication. YouTube does not produce videos, right? So we have a new form of capitalism that has learned to directly exploit human cooperation. And isn't that what cooperatives are meant to do? You know, they are meant to create this layer of cooperation in production and consumption and to create democratic enterprise, right? So th I think this is the paradox I would like to talk to you about, is that here is an historic emergence of a new layer of human cooperation, right? So the way to think about this is that communication, coordination, transaction costs for sharing and collaboration have dramatically declined. So things that were not possible before outside of a hierarchical enterprise become, become enabled and empowered through technology um, for basically civic self-organization, right? And you would think this is something that cooperatives would be naturally inclined to do. And it's not happening. So here's the paradox. Capital has understood the hyper-productivity of the commons economy, of the sharing economy, of human cooperation. And co-ops are nowhere to be seen. I, I think this is, a, uh, for me, this is something dramatic. Um, so if you look at this slide here, it shows you how the current dominant form of the commons economy is operating. So you have open contributory systems that um, where people are contributing, paid or unpaid, to create a shared knowledge base for their activity, right? Now, of course, we need to live. We need to have shelter. We need to pay rent, buy a house, buy food for families. So around these commonses, which are themselves outside of the market, right? This is, you have to understand, something that is abundant, when there is no tension between supply and demand, you can download Linux for free, you can download Arduino designs for free. You can download Wikihouse and Wikispace designs for free. This itself is outside of the market. But around these commonses, around these sharing platforms, there is a huge opportunity to create added value services for the market. So you think about Linux, for example, why would there be a Linux economy? Well, it's very easy. It has to be installed. It has to be maintained. It has to be serviced. It has to be improved, it has to be strategized, it has to be integrated, it has to be insured, it has to be certified, right? So around a commons, which is outside the market, you can have a thriving economy, one-sixth of GDP in the US. Um, yeah, maybe an example of why it's actually good business sense to do so is the, is the contrast between Europe and the US in terms of geographical information. So in Europe, every country produces its own geographical information and believes that it should recoup that investment. So the government thinks, I think wrongly, because we already paid for it. It was done through taxation, right? So the citizens actually paid for it already. So it produces geographical information. And it says, no, no, we have to recoup this. So they do an, uh, auctions. And in every European country, you'll find two or three companies that have a monopoly on the exploitation of public geographic data. It's a small market. A few hundred people in Belgium, a few hundred people in every country. Yeah? In the US, paradoxically, they created a public commons. They said the geographic data of the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, are for all citizens to use. So you have a thriving geolocation economy of all kinds of entrepreneurs creating added value on this free public base with, I think, about 400,000 people making a living that way, right? So the commons is actually, uh, you know, actually creates economies around it. And so here's the problem. How can we move from a purely extractive vision on these common resources to a generative vision? Right? So an extractive vision is how can I maximize my profit based on these human or natural resources? That's the mainstream model. A generative approach is how can I create livelihoods 
around the creation of these shared resources and create a thriving generative economy around it. Now, this is why I like Inspiral. And Inspiral is a co-op. That's why I, I use it here as a model. So this is how the commons economy works. So at the heart of value creation today, we don't have private people, workers, and capital. We actually have citizens, paid or unpaid, participating in the creation of shared resources. Around these shared resources, we have entrepreneurial coalitions, which create added value around that common resource. So Linux companies creating added value around Linux for the market. Arduino companies creating added value resources um, around their design commons. The key issue is what form does that entrepreneurial coalition take? And my argument to you from the co-op world would be it could take a generative cooperative form. Right? So why are the, the co-ops not creating co-ops for Uber drivers? You know, the application is not rocket science. Right? So why, why is there no co-ops to date that create co-ops for ride hailing, for example? It's a huge market opportunity, right? Instead of sending 20 or 30% of the surplus value from your local city to, to Silicon Valley, you could keep it here, right? So there, there is an opportunity there to create generative business models. So generative means how can I co-create a cooperative, collaborative network of entrepreneurs that create added value around this shared resource. Um, now, just let me explain then how this works here in, uh, with your neighbors. So, Inspiral is a network of social entrepreneurs. So, they have a tagline that says, stuff that matters. So, basically, every entrepreneur that joins the network wants to solve ecological or social issues. That's their mission-oriented purpose-driven. They can be for profit, but they are reinvesting the profits in the social goal. Okay, That network is producing several commonses. One is called Lumio, which I use in the P2P Foundation. Lumio is an open source, democratic decision-making uh, platform for virtual communities. So, any business, any human group which has people in different locations where it's difficult to make decisions together, you can use Lumio. Lumio is really easy to use. Yesterday in the public lecture, there were quite a few people using Lumio here. Um, and Lumio basically allows you to organize discussions and then to have a whole variety of decision-making systems. You can choose lazy majority, super majority, consensus, consent, consensus minus one, a whole so every unit and every enterprise can choose its own way of making decisions. Um, and Spiral has a second commons which is called co-budgeting. So all the all the co-op members that are the heart of Inspiral pay a membership fee, and that membership fee goes into a common pot. People control their own pot, but you can make proposals for reinvestment, and so people will invest in each other, right? And this is called co-budgeting. So this is the commons that on which every enterprise in the Inspiral network is co-dependent. They are co-funding, co-developing these commons. The Ethical Entrepreneurial Coalition, the generative business coalition around the Inspiral commons, are these 18 business ventures. And then the third one is very important. It's the Inspiral Foundation. The Inspiral Foundation is a for-benefit association that manages, enables, and empowers the infrastructure of cooperation of Inspiral without commanding the production. Right? So think about the Wikimedia Foundation in the Wikipedia. They do the fundraising because the servers need to be paid. But they don't tell anyone what to write for the Wikipedia. 
the Linux Foundation protect the software commons and the licenses of Linux. They uh, regulate the conflicts between the different businesses that work with Linux. They regulate the conflicts between the community of contributors and the companies, etc., etc. But they do not tell anyone within the Linux uh, commons what to produce. A another point which I'd like to also uh, point out is it's another way of thinking, and this is very important. And I know for some people it sounds a bit strange, but it's thinking about abundance rather than scarcity. So what's the basic assumption of a company and economists, neoliberal economists and others, is we live in a world of scarcity where people are competing for resources, right? And we use a pricing mechanism to allocate resources. But even NGOs think that way. Think about Doctors Without Borders. Here's the idea. You have civil war somewhere, so there's a problem. People don't get access to health care. We'll raise funds and we'll direct the doctors to do the health care um, in a place where there is a civil war. The for benefit associations in this new emerging model do not think that way. How do they think? They think there is a problem. There are enough people who want and can contribute to solving that problem. So we're going to invest and maintain an infrastructure of cooperation that will allow people to contribute to the solving of that problem, right? So that's what these foundations do. The Inspire Foundation maintains the infrastructure that these 18 business ventures can use and that people outside can also contribute because Lumio is an open source software. And I think the good news is that Inspire Foundation is a cooperative, right? So I use the notion of open cooperativism. And let me tell, maybe tell you why I'm doing this. Um, probably here. So you see here, open cooperativism, right? Um, so here's, here's what our society is thinking about how the world works. This is the dominant mainstream vision. Nature is infinite. And we have an infinite growth system with a finite material world. The next thing we think is we want artificial scarcity. So knowledge which, which could flee freely through digital networks and does, if you want, if you, even if we don't want it, it does, it does flow. We believe we should have artificial scarcity. In other words, we create legislation, intellectual property, which has some justification, but we, we go now to such extremes, right, that everything that can flow, we want to dam it up. So if John Deere does that with uh, tractors, uh, Monsanto does it with seeds. So we have gone from the market as a scarcity allocation system to sc scarcity engineering. Like, how can we make something scarce? This is the dominant way of thinking. And of course, we do these two things without regard for fair distribution of the value, right? These are the three systemic problems of our world. So the good news is that people are working massively on finding solutions. Uh, Paul Hawken already a few years ago in, in his book, Blessed Unrest, calculated there were already then two million organizations in the world working on sustainability. Um, think about your own work as a co-op, the solidarity economy, the cooperative economy, um, the, all these new, not so new actually, 19th century. Uh, so all these forms today in most, in most societies are 10, 15 percent of economic streams, maybe more I heard in, in South Australia. And then we have the openness, the sharing of knowledge and resources. So just to tell you uh, around openness, there's, that's another interesting statistic in, in, in the Netherlands. From 1980 to 2005, there is a linear slow growth of non-state, non-corporate initiatives. From 2005 to today, there is an exponential growth of non-state, non-corporate initiatives. This is happening in the whole world. If you would map out in Adelaide 
what I've seen in Amsterdam, in Berlin, in Milan, in many, many European cities, there are so many citizen initiatives to reorganize the food supply, to reorganize renewable energy supply, that there's so many arrows on the maps that you cannot see the map, right? Co-working, maker spaces, fab labs, they're all growing exponentially. Time banks, complement, complementary currencies. So the problem is that a lot of people are doing this, but they're doing this in a fragmented way. They're not looking at each other. And so it looks that the dominant system is dominant and that there's nothing you can do about it. Well, actually on the ground, many, many, many people are trying to solve these systemic issues. So what is open cooperativism? This is my proposal to the co-ops. Open co-ops are mission-oriented, purpose-driven. So they can make profit, but it's reinvested in social co-op. They're multi-stakeholder. So think about Uber. If you would have a platform cooperative, this is the term we use in this particular context, platform cooperativism. If you have an open platform, it should be co-managed by the user communities and all the stakeholder communities. The Uber drivers, the Uber riders. Maybe the city, which has a stake in mobility, etc., etc. So this is something we call platform cooperativism, which is a form of open cooperativism. But the third thing is very important, which is to actually co-create commons, to actually co-create shared resources. Most co-ops that I know even if they do good things, they work for their members or their shareholders, even if it's one, one man, one share. So I'm suggesting that in order to have this convergence between the hyper-productivity of these new open models and the social justice and democratic aspects of cooperativism, we need to move to this convergent model of open cooperativism. The change is that you are actually actively co-creating common goods. And why would you do this? Because if you don't do it, the extractive business models are already doing it, right? Capital has understood the hyper-productivity of these shared resource models. And it's really high time that the cooperative world understands the hyper-productivity of these new open models. Um, now, I also think there is a role here for, okay, maybe one more thing, uh, which may be a bit complicated, but the kind of license you use is very important. Today, we have privatized licenses, intellectual property, so you don't share, right? Mondragon doesn't share its intellectual property. Or you can have open licenses like the general public license used for Linux and, o and free software. I think here is a little problem. If you say that everybody can share and commercialize, then you immediately have big groups, well-funded groups that dominate these open source economies. So IBM dominates the Linux economy, right? In software, it's hard to convince people that this is a problem because actually today, if you look at all the big new software that's important, it's been done by a few people in a garage you, because the, you don't need a lot of capital to develop knowledge goods. You need people with bodies and brains with access to the networks. And you, as you probably know, the average duration of living with your family today in Italy is 42, right? So if you're a young developer or young web designer, you, you can do it. But what if you have, if you want to move to distributed manufacturing? Right? You need a fab lab, you need 3D printing machines, you need raw material, etc., etc. So I think in this context, it would be healthy to get a new types of licenses that requests reciprocity. So the copy fair license scheme is a proposal that says the following, everybody can share our knowledge. There's no restriction. So you, you remain the advantages 
of an open contributory system. But if you want to commercialize it, you have to reciprocate to our shared resource. So just to give you an example, there is something called a Fair Shares Association. It's a new prop property model that is used by uh, newly emerging co-ops that says the following, one quarter for the founders, so you, you recognize the entrepreneurial activity of the founders, one quarter for the funders, one quarter for the workers, and one quarter for the users. So it, it recognizes the co-creation of value by the user communities of these platforms. They have a scheme that does copy fair in a fairly easy way. So everybody can use their knowledge base to a Creative Commons non-commercial license. It, it allows you to use the knowledge but not to make money from it. If you want to make money, you have to become a member of the association. So that's the reciprocity. You pay a membership fee and then you get the Creative Commons commercial license. Right? So this is, I hope you can follow my reasoning. Uh, so the idea is to create a membrane around the commons that requires reciprocity. Which, by the way, solves one of the big issues of capitalism, which is the ignorance of externalities. Right? We, we ignore externalities, social environment externalities. Through these types of agreements, copy fair licenses, you recognize the codependency around the commons. So you, you introduce a moral principle of reciprocity within the functioning of the marketplace. I think this is quite important. All right. Um, here's something I think is very important. And let me first say a, a few words about sustainability, because this is really important. It's a series of arguments that, uh, that I use to, to try to show you that why we need to move to this new model. First, if you design in a company, you design for scarcity, right? Planned obsolescence is not a bug, it's a feature. Every product on the marketplace has planned obsolescence. Otherwise, you cannot maintain market scarcity. But every product in open design communities, whether it's Wikispeed, five times as fuel efficient as commercial cars, where it's WikiHouse, carbon positive housing. All these open source projects have sustainability built in because there's no incentive to do it any other way. So if you can have a global open design community using all the knowledge from all the professionals in that sector, and then you have an ethical entrepreneurial coalition, you actually have sustainable products and designs. They have not been artificially be made unsustainable. The second thing is, um, once you work that way, so once you have a coalition of entrepreneurs that are codependent on a shared resource, collaboration becomes systemic. Once you have that collaboration, transparency becomes a requirement. So Inspiral is fully transparent. Any member of, of Inspiral has access to the supply chain and accounting of all the business ventures within Inspiral. Now, this is not entirely ready yet, but I, I maybe have heard about the blockchain. Um, I just come from a five-day blockchain workshop in Sydney. And the blockchain is a ledger that is associated with the currency Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is a problematic currency, but uh, the ledger is something very interesting because it can certify identity, create permanent identities online. Think about this, open source, blockchain-based supply chains, right? Creating entrepreneurial coalition that operates in a transparent way and can use the blockchain to open up the supply chain. This is happening, it's called Provenance, provenance.org. It's a US project that uh, works on creating transparent supply chains across the board. Uh, you probably heard of the Fairphone, it's one example of such a company that wants to create uh, mobile phones that are entirely ethical. So every step of the production process is open and transparent so you can check yourself how it is made, in what conditions, etc. 
So the sustainability, so mutualization of shared resources of knowledge, car sharing, bike sharing, machine sharing, has huge sustainability uh, advantages. So let me give you an idea why this is important. And maybe tell you before that on average, open source hardware costs one eighth of the price of commercial hardware. So if you want a microscope, you can buy the 15,000 euro Zeiss microscope, or you can buy the Open SPIM, or maybe it's Open SIM, which is a 1,000 open, 1,000 euro open source equivalent with the same characteristics. And don't tell anyone, it's designed by the same engineers in their spare time, right? So in general, it's one eighth. So this brings us back to the actually founding moment of the cooperative movement. So if you remember 19th century, before Rochdale, co-ops tried to do production. It didn't work very well. They didn't have the same amount of capital as private entrepreneurs. And then they started with this grocery shop, right, in, in Rochdale. Now, the Rochdale pioneers had a choice. They could actually operate at 40% less than private grocers. But they didn't do that. They said, we'll do it at 15% less, otherwise they'll kill us, right? And so they had this surplus value of 25%, which they reinvested in housing, creating cooperative housing, creating cooperative universities, etc. So here is my proposal to, to you. If you do open source hardware, and you can produce at one eighth of the cost of your competition, you have a very interesting business pro business proposition, right? Because you can have that surplus and reinvest it in the cooperative economy. This hasn't been done yet. Um, and the time is now, because private capital is investing. Ten, I have 10 minutes left. All right. So I'm still with my sustainability thing. And so here's my argument in a nutshell. If we use all the steps of the open source stack, we can save 80% of matter and energy for the same level of production, right? We make 80% gains in thermodynamic efficiency. Uh, the big part is the following though, and I haven't mentioned that yet. The rule, the promise of peer production, Global open design communities linked to distributed machinery for distributed manufacturing. Is that we can follow a rule that is very simple to remember. If it's heavy, it's local. If it's light, it's global. So the potential to combine global open design communities, global and open knowledge flow, with a capacity to actually produce locally through micro factories using these new type of machineries can save up to two thirds of the cost in matter and energy of contemporary production. Because what it shows, if you don't look at the financials, financials don't look at externalities. If you look at real matter and energy flows, it's two thirds, one third production, two thirds transportation. That is what's happening today, right? So I don't know what you could produce here in, in South Australia, but I'm pretty sure there's things that you could do locally that would recreate an industrial policy based on distributed manufacturing and create jobs here. You know, um, this is, I'm just dreaming here, right? I'm dreaming of some place in the world, which could be here, that would become the primary example in the world for distributed manufacturing, where WikiHouse and WikiSpeed would actually be supported to create prototyping of a new mode of making things. Um, you know, I see no reason why, if you need electric cars, you know, get them here. It's not just Wikis, WikiSpeed, you have the Tabby. The Tabby is a two-person city car, entirely electric, that's actually funded by Italian and Chinese families. It's made in cooperation with all the fab labs in the world. But we still need to have a place where these things become, you know, the pioneers.
So this is my, I'm dreaming, right? I'm dreaming to come back here and see all these things in South Australia. Um, okay, to conclude, maybe a word about the role of the, the government. How can we overcome the asymmetric competition between sustainable, shared, solidarity-based economic models, which are emerging everywhere but are fragmented, hopelessly fragmented, and giants, oligop oligopolistic giants like Uber and Airbnb, which were sweeping over the world in just like 18 months' time with huge backing of venture capital. They're actually making losses, huge losses, in order to obtain these monopoly positions. Well, I think the answer is to see the government as a convener, as a agent uh, that creates ecosystemic effects within the fragmented new economy. So here's my dream again. I call it sustainability empowerment platforms. In Melbourne, you have the Open Food Network. In Christchurch, it's called Food Resilience Network. It's already happening without you, uh, but it's happening in precarity, without any security, by people who are actually sacrificing themselves for everyone else. So all the people who are producing non-toxic food and the user communities, the consumers interested in obtaining non-toxic food, why not create a platform, right, which creates ecosystemic effects and policy within this fear of transition towards sustainable food? Why not create a sustainability empowerment platform for consumer-owned renewable energy co-ops? Why not create one for mobility as a commons? That's what they're doing in Finland. In Finland, in Helsinki, within 10 years, they don't want any private car in the city anymore. And they're using a commons-based um, idea of mobility as a commons for everyone. And you'll, you'll have an oyster cart that will allow you to do taxis, oyster, all kinds of uh, different things with one cart. So the mobility is seen as an integrated ecosystem, right? As a common good. So I think this is something that could happen at the city level, could happen at the state level, and that would create this kind of ecosystemic effects between what is already happening, but is not coming together. Okay, very fast, how much minutes? All right, so just to give you, it's happening. Bologna regulation for the care, and um, yeah, uh, it's somewhere, but I... Uh, so the Bologna regulation for the care and regeneration of the urban commons allows any neighborhood collective in Bologna to propose improvements to the streets and squares and neighborhoods. There is a review process and then negotiation between the city as a for-benefit association. So the city plays the same role as the foundations by enabling and empowering citizens to do these projects through funding, financial, technical, and other forms of support. So this is really interesting. It's, uh, it, it, it's not a public service with passive consumers. It's a public social, public civic, public commons partnership, right? Where the, cit the city becomes a partner state, and actually they call it city as a commons. So not commons in the city, but actually even more uh, ambitious, the city is seen as a commons, as a common good. Barcelona, Fab City 5.0. Uh, I'm not sure about the status of the project because there's a new government and I'm not sure how they're going to take it over, but the aim was to relocalize production 50% by 2050. Half of production, half of food done in the city around the city of Barcelona by supporting the creation of 24 fab labs, one in each neighborhood, specialized in textile, in book printing, to uh, save the crafts, which are still there, but they're dying out, connect them with young people and with digital technology in order to create a high-tech, high-knowledge-intensive digital industry that can relocate production within the city. Um, Seoul Sharing City, 
going into each neighborhood to ask people what kind of service they want to mutualize and then developing a sharing city policy based on the civic input. So it's not a venture capital based strategy. It's based on the civic uh, participation. So it's, it's happening and I'd like to see it happen here as well with a, a big role for the co-ops. Thank you. Um, how's your head? How are you all familiar? You just got a master class PhD level insight into cooperatives. Um, what we wanted to do was basically get an idea of what the landscape is and what people's problems and issues are. And basically you've got an opportunity to quiz Michelle in the uh, last day of his Australian tour before his brain explodes. But we thought this would just be a great opportunity to see what people are working on, uh, see what issues they have and maybe connect people in the room and maybe give people an opportunity just to test their ideas against Michelle. So if people have any questions or thoughts, I'll uh, let you hit them um, over to Michelle. You're all stunned. Uh, stunned <laughs> I've got a Um, well, I, what I think is, you know, what, what is very difficult nowadays with so-called participatory processes, you know, I have this all the time. The European Commission opens up policy making, you know, and you have three weeks, and I don't have the time. So the only people actually participating are lobbyists who get paid to do this and have the time to, you know, jump in these, these windows. So that for me is not working. Uh, so what I propose, what you can see on this thing here is actually structures that I think should be citizen-led. Uh, so I talk about the assembly of the commons, which is all the citizens involved in producing, protecting the shared resources. And the chamber of the commons, which is for all the ethical entrepreneurs creating added value and livelihoods around these shared resources. And the idea for me is to create a permanent voice for these people uh, and, and more permanent you know, participatory processes that can you know, educate, co-educate the citizens and, and the governments. Now, politically, this of course depends on your color, uh, but I tell you what I think about it. Um, if you look at Europe, you can see that the P2P in the Commons, even if they may not use that language, has a very important political role. So the first example, which I don't like, is Spain. Spain has a active anti-P2P, anti-Commons government. Makes it very difficult to do crowdfunding, for example, because they want to protect the banks. Put a 40,000 euro tax on renewable energy because they want to protect the oil companies. This is, of course, not a good example, uh, but it exists, right? The second example, I think, is much more tricky, is what is happening in the, in the Netherlands, in the UK, and in Finland, which is using that language, but within a context of hyper-neoliberalization. So it's basically saying the welfare state is dead, but you can do it yourself. You don't need us anymore. Right? So think about the uh, UK. Uh, all the funding for humanities has been cut, 0% left. 50% uh, of libraries are closed. The women's shelters are closing. The youth shelters are closing. Um, but it's embedded in a language of the big society, of community, of self empowerment. And the same happened in the Netherlands, right? It's called decentralization. It moves down to the cities with one third less of the budget. So this is a second model. So I think the good model is the third model, which is where the partner city or the partner state acts as a true enabling mechanism for this emergence, 
uh, but sustains it, feeds it, uh, creates the right conditions so that it can emerge in a healthy way. Um, and of course, I hope that South Australia is, is, is would be doing that, so that, this option, which is the option of Bologna and of Seoul. Uh, so we can't see it in any national level, but we can see it emerging in, in uh, cities with progressive uh, governments. Um, yes, it's, it's uh, I, I'm not sure exactly how they do it in Bologna. Um, um, what, what I've seen in most of these projects in Italy, it's, you know, it's like Co-Mantova, Co-Bataglia, Co-Palermo, Co-Bologna, etc. is that they use a five-star gov governance model. Um, so you have the core is enabling people to do things, and these are called active citizens. So they can make proposals. And then you have four players, the city, the chamber of commerce, the research institutions, and civil, so civil, the civil society NGOs that are the, the conveners enablers, right? And they actually make contracts. And I'm not actually not sure exactly how that works. But um, um, yeah. I, I know now we live in a culture where everything has to be measured, but very often this is counterproductive uh, because you are distorting, you know, like a holistic system and looking at very detailed things. And I think in the commons, this is not the way to go. There has to, there has to remain some kind of emergent quality to it because if you put people together and they're participatory, you cannot account for all the results that will come out of this, right? Um, so uh, I don't really have an answer to this. Um, one of the things that you could look into is called Intego accounting. So there's now, um, I have this on my wiki. Um, let's see. Yeah, so uh, Intego accounting and, and many other forms of accounting are ways to get away from the purely financial measurement. Right to actually recognize well-being. I can't remember details, but there's six different criteria that are used in, in integral accounting. So you, you can have much more flexible agreements if you use more holistic accounting systems than just the, you know, the, the neoliberal financial uh, stress. Um, maybe I should talk a little bit about this. Um, just as an example, what's happening uh, in the Netherlands, they found out that nurses only worked for five years. They're so stressed by their measurement and control, and you know every minute thing they do is measured, and, and that they don't like to work anymore. And so you know we're getting people from the Philippines and Indonesia because the Dutch woman didn't want to be nurses anymore. So what's happening now is that there's a project called Buurtzorg Neighborhood Care which in like 18 months time has 5,000 nurses fleeing, literally fleeing from the hospitals to these new co-ops. Groups of 15 nurses in the neighborhood without any management, using internet scheduling to coordinate their work, using 30 staff to help them certification training, but it's not a management structure, it's a support structure. And they're able to do uh, public health care at 40% less than the traditional private health care institutions. Um, just saying, uh, this is an interesting thing that is happening um, in different places where workers are just fleeing overtly controlled, measured, 
Um, there's a whole movie in the Netherlands. It's called The Honor of the Profession, Beroeps Eer. I know this because I speak Dutch, so I, I follow this area a bit more. And it's jurists, teachers, postmen, uh, who are basically revolting against you know the neoliberal regime within work, which is making people really unhappy uh, because it's based on mistrust, on ever more control. Um, so I, I don't think we can use these methods, you know, with the commons. It's just not going to work. So we need to find new ways. The good news is you can all find this on my wiki. We have 20,000 articles that have been viewed 30 million times. So this is in a category about accounting. You'll find alternative GDP, you'll find integral accounting, you'll find something called contributory accounting because contributory communities are developing new types of accounting, not based on labor, but based on contributions um, to reward you know, the common work in a more fair way. You'll find another section on law. There are a lot of new legal instruments being built by these communities. So we, we are living in a very interesting time. And you know, most of you may not have heard much about it. It's because the press doesn't talk about it, the universities don't talk about it, but it's actually happening at a pretty massive scale. But you just have to be, you know, find the right way to get in tune with it and see what is happening. And it's, yeah, I'm, I'm a pathological optimist. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I mean, in the world I live in, the, the consensus is we accept trademarks, but we don't like intellectual property. Um, now, imagine you're a young entrepreneur today, and I actually met somebody from a synthetic biology company, and he told me the biggest mistake I made was to patent my knowledge. He spent $300,000 and months and months and months to get his patents. And he said, if I would have spent the same time and energy in actually working with the synthetic biology commons, I would have been uh, fur much further than, than keeping. Uh, so I, I don't think competition goes away, but it's kind of inverting the logic, right? Now we have this kind of sports metaphor. So we have every team playing against every other team, but within the team we cooperate. And I think what happens in the new uh, system is we cooperate around the shared resources that we all benefit from. But within that sphere, people are still better than others and may attract more clients than others because they have more embodied knowledge, experience, you know, maybe faster machines. Um, so there's still an, an element of, of competition even within that sphere, but with a much stronger level of cooperation as well. So it's, it's not like all or nothing. It's some, some, something in between. And my, my vision particularly, you know, which I'm discussing with people like Inspiral is, so you have a core of really cooperative enterprises that share this kind of ethical value system. And then the question is, how do you deal with the others? And so we are looking into what we call transitional measures that socialize and culturalize extractive businesses into the cooperative culture. So one of the things that Inspiral is now proposing is called capped investments. So basically saying, you know, you can invest in us and we will guarantee 15 times your investment. But when that's done, and I think that's actually pretty good, you know, but of course for venture capital is not enough, but 15 times your investment is pretty good return. Then we'll ceremoniously gift it to the commons and you'll be honored for it. So do you understand the logic of it? It's like you have a core of cooperative enterprise. They understand each other. They share the value system. And then they open up to the outside, but on certain conditions. And what are those conditions? That is what we're trying to find out. Instead of having, you know, like closed systems, right, where you can only rely on your own investment. And, and um, so, yeah, that's kind of the game we're playing. 
Well, it's hard to say. Um, it depends uh, what kind of society we get. Uh, you know, you think about Apple, right? It's entirely dependent on public research. Like, they actually don't innovate that much. It's like 96% of innovations are from public research. And they use child labor in, in China. Um, so that's why they're competitive. If you look at Uber and Airbnb, why are they competitive? Because they don't pay health insurance, they don't pay any of the other things that other companies have to pay for. Um, so, yeah, the question is, do you want these kind of companies to survive? Is it fair play? So, I would say probably not. And so if you would work on child labor laws, and for example, refuse to import anything that is produced with child labor, these companies would not exist. So it's not an economic thing, it's actually a political thing. It's the kind of decisions we make about what's acceptable, you know, in terms of practice. Um, well, you know, I don't know because th they're also very clever. For example, as you know, Apple uses an open source uh, operating system. They just took it over and adapted it to their own. Um, generally speaking, extractive minded businesses will find ways to cooperate at the same time, non cooperate. Um, and they do these things pretty well. Uh, so for me, the, actually the focus is the wrong focus. Is, you know, I want to focus my work on what these ethical entrepreneurs are doing. And for example, one, one of the big areas of concern is how can co-ops, the open model and the co-op model converge into something that's at the same time very competitive and fair. I think that's the interesting question. And we cannot predict what the others will do, but I think we should work on what we can do. Yes? Then you. Yeah. Hi, um, Thank you both for your very interesting talk. Um, my name is Chris Sampson. My startup, uh, Future Earth Systems, is focused on design of frameworks and platforms for um, digital age commerce. Um, Sounds like a dream, yeah. Right. Well, I think this is one of the big issues that you're, you're alerting us to, is that there's no incubators for these alternative uh, models. So if you're a young, digital, even commons-oriented person, and there are many, um, you go to the university, you go to the incubators, and what you get to learn is the venture capital-based investment, which is a winner-take-all system. You know, for every 100, one will win the big prize and 99 will fail. Um, and if you want to do that in a different way, you're on your own. Um, so one of, one of the things is convince people like, um, I forgot your name, uh, Catherine and um, Chris, no? Vaughan uh, and others. And I'm meeting the minister this afternoon, right? So. Let's hope 
to actually create you know publicly funded social oriented incubators for these new types of businesses that create shared resources common goods and create entrepreneurial activity around it or you can do what Inspiral has done which is to do it you know find people like yourself and create mutual aid uh, support structures I think you probably need to do both uh, the people are out here there are people like this here and they all have the same complaint as you and that's how Inspiral started just by a few people saying you know, it's so damn hard to do the right thing. Let's support each other. And they have a very strong commitment to mutual aid. They're developing all kinds of solidarity mechanisms. They help each other get mortgages. You know, I mean, they're... So joining in spiral, it's like, you know, your level of anxiety as an entrepreneur just goes dramatically down. Because you know you have friends that support you in your entrepreneurial journey. Yes. Um, well, not really in planning itself, but you know, if you, uh, uh, if I can put you in touch with the people in Bologna and Seoul and, and other cities that are thinking in this direction, and they probably can tell you more. There's a, I work with somebody called Christian Yayone from LabGov in Rome, and they're specialized in this. So, yeah, I can connect you with these uh, more expert people than me. I I can unfortunately not follow everything, so. Uh, but I do have a big section on urbanism in my wiki. Well, you find plenty of examples. Um. Yeah. Right, well, the, I, I think the blockchain itself is not mature, uh, so this is really experimental, and I think probably in 2017, the, the first working you know, non-prototype uh, products and service will be out. But just to tell you, I, you know, I, I was spent these days in Melbourne. The Sydney, the Sydney Blockchain Works was funded by Commonwealth Bank, like 50 people, everything was paid, nice hotel, tall ship. Uh, you know, they're seeing something in there. Then I went to the Westpac blockchain workshop where they were telling us things like the blockchain will, will save 20 billion a year in infrastructural investments. And of course, they want to tap into the $500 billion a year migration remittances uh, market. Uh, so from that point of view, you know, they're, they believe in it and they're funding it and and then I went to Suncorp in, that, in the same afternoon and they're also working uh, on blockchain. Uh, so definitely, the, you know, the big funders are on board. Uh, but everything else like Inspiral is just off-the-shelf uh, software. 
And of course, they're developing their own things. And there's something that I that you can look up. It's called the Collaborative Technology Alliance, which is in Spiral-like, uh, a dozen organizations in the world. And they're making their infrastructures interoperable. So it's not about competing with Facebook or developing everything new. Is they each have bits and pieces. And they decided to, two months ago to create an ecosystem uh, with all these different collaborative technologies. But basically, you know, it's all available off the shelf. I mean, not perfect in a way, but, um, you know, you have discussion forums, you have accounting systems, you have all kinds of things which have, you know, online capacities and, and um, yeah, we would need to talk about what precisely your needs are, but uh, it, it's, it's most likely available. Uh, I d there's not much software left which doesn't have an open source version, you know, including CRM and, and supply chains. And I'm working very closely with people building open supply chains. Um, so that's not yet fully operational, but you know it's coming. It's really getting to maturity. Yeah. What what kind of business are you in? All right, <laughs> but I think one of the first things to do here in Adelaide and South Australia might be actually to have some kind of observatory. Uh, first of all, mapping, you know, just mapping what's there. And there's so much there already that you don't know. Uh, and to have at least some outfit that is, you know, that actually knows what's happening. Uh, you know, I can see the difference. Um, I went in Victoria, in Sydney, Victoria State three years ago. And everybody was looking at me like an alien. Like most of you are still looking at me like that. <laughs> uh, what, what is he talking about? Uh, but then I went, you know, last week, and it was completely different. So in just three years, you wake up some people, plant some seeds, and people start doing their own research and, you know, getting familiar with it. And if I come back here, it will be different already. And you have brilliant people here. <laughs> Yeah, you need you may need some digital champions like Matt, right? <laughs> Annoying people, huh? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, if, if you look at the example from Emilia Romagna, which I showed in the beginning, you know, again, one of the richest regions in Europe with the lowest unemployment rate. The reason they're so successful is because they've they've done this. Even in the, they start in the 70s, right? Way before the digital. But the idea was that SMEs on, on their own are too busy surviving to actively cooperate. So it's the government that created structures of support for every sector in the economy. And 40% is co-op and another 30% is SME. And so they create these kind of service organizations. I mean, what Mondragon has done for itself, I don't know why it worked there, that has been done in Emilia-Romagna through the government support. And, you know, that creates actually these cooperative arrangements between, you know, in every particular sector, right? So this is already, we know this works, but I think the other layer now, now it's still prototyping stage, but this is, you have to start somewhere, right? And I, I just think I could see, for example, if the government needs, to, wants to support, you know, electric driven cars, why not make them? You know, they're here already, but they're probably bought from Tesla or, no? 
They're made here? Fantastic. Well, and I'm pretty sure they're precarious and, and struggling to survive. Right. Yeah. So here's an example uh, that I didn't know about, right? So these are the things I think that you should be supporting. Um, and these new models can bring all the knowledge that you need uh, to make you know, competitive uh, electric vehicles locally. Um, you, know, you would have to see for each, uh, but I think starting, starting to experiment and support distributed manufacturing, prototyping, it's really now is the time to do it. And you know, my argument, and of course you don't have to believe this, but if you look at things like peak resources, you, know, you look at the dates at which different resources will become scarce, you know, it's not always going to be like today, where cheap oil and cheap labor are going to even allow us to get stuff from abroad. So I think you have to anticipate a world where resources will be much more scarce than today, and now is the time to anticipate and to actually build the prototypes to be adaptive when, you know, when these challenges come to you. So here's the dream. You know, if you would do this here, it's not just about making and selling things here, it's about becoming a model for others and actually think about all the educational services you could create if you would have an attractive, you know, state-of-the-art distributed manufacturing policy. Uh, people are interested everywhere in this and there's as yet not one place to go. You know, that act actively support things like Wikispeed, Wikihouse, Arduino, um, And I would hope with you know, some kind of social-oriented incubator that, sh that shows people that there's other ways to, to create companies. And you know, I'm not saying not show the other one, but at least show that there's a variety of options you know, according to your value systems and stuff. And so that you also can choose the cooperative way and find this convergence between the open models and the, the cooperative models. Yes, and I think we should, yeah, so this is the last one, or unless, anybody else? Okay, so this will be the last one, yeah. Yes, I, so I think what I've seen, these projects only work wherever there's a strong attention to culture. So if you think about Inspiral, they do Inspiral retreats. You know, and the Inspiral retreat is where the value system of Inspiral is transmitted in very intensive five days. Uh, and that's the filter. If you don't like it, you don't stay, right? So there is a lot of facilitation, group work, um, that the, like in Bologna, the biggest uh, you, you know the biggest problem was actually the culture of public officials. But they've won that battle. They they now have a, a core of people within the Bologna city who fully understand you know the participatory models and are very comfortable wi working with it. But of course, it wasn't that way like seven years ago, where people were saying, "Hey, we are the boss, right? We we decide policy and." So that was a, you know, that was a cultural process, actually. A lot more general. It's just our. Sorry, we run a weekly um, information share, sharing session. It's very low key. 
um, very informal and questions throughout the session um, and it's only half an hour so um, yeah, I think so it's more I of an over maybe an overview of what you do. Yeah, I, I won't talk about the co-ops, I won't yeah. talk about the government, but I'll kind of talk about the relationship between productive communities and entrepreneurs. Yeah, that sounds perfect. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll focus I think, just on yeah. that. I think it's so. easily happy. Yeah, perfect. <laughs>
right now, we're going to do a program. I think we keep one week after the